Welcome to Acquisitions Anonymous, Internet's number one podcast about buying, selling, and investing in small businesses. Today's episode was really a ton of fun. We dug into something that we know absolutely nothing about. So just like every other episode, uh, and we went in and really dug into a marketplace doing $12 million a year uh, for people who want to buy and sell excess weeks at timeshare. So we dug into what's going on in the travel industry, how to think about marketplaces. Is this a good business? And then lastly, we dug into how would we figure out how to make this business work if we were to buy it. So great episode. Me, Michael, uh, Bill, and Heather, we had a ton of fun. We missed meals today, but great episode nonetheless. Hope you enjoy it. Here it is. This episode of Acquisitions Anonymous is sponsored by Acquisition Lab. Acquisition Lab uh, and their team, they've been longtime supporters of the pod, and they provide a really great service for people who are looking to acquire a business. So it's created by Walker Dybel, who's become a friend, uh, the author of Buy Then Build, How to Outsmart the Startup Game. Uh, so Acquisition Lab's an accelerator with a highly vetted, cohort-based educational and support community for people who are serious about buying a business. So a lot of our listeners like you, you tune in every week to our deal reviews, you want to get in on buying a business, uh, you know, you're on this podcast because you're trying to learn how to buy a business. But if you're not quite sure where to start, Acquisition Lab is a great place to start. So they exist to help people buy a business and to navigate all those complexities of the process, everything you hear us talk about on the show. They provide a proven framework, tools, and resources that support you all the way from search to close. Uh, they do it. There's a whole bunch of educational material. Uh, and support. So if you're serious about buying a business, check out acquisitionlab.com, or you can actually email the program director, uh, Chelsea Wood, directly. Her email is chelsea at buythenbuild.com. All right, guys, I will tell you something. Recording podcasts, especially with no scripting and no editing, is much easier than recording YouTube videos. I was telling Heather how horrible it is. I've recorded, I've recorded the same video three times on YouTube, and every time it's ruined. And I have a feeling my third time might be ruined as well. So I'm excited to do a podcast with you guys because there's no editing that goes on here. We just go. I want to, my God, I want to see the outtakes. Like, you're, you, did you know? Like, here are the three things I do to manage to see it. Fuck. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> <this guy. laughs> oh, man. There's everything. There's like, I'm recording some with my phone. I'm recording in this setup. Like, I drop stuff. Like, I drop the camera. It's too dark. Yesterday, I recorded a bunch of stuff and discovered the audio wasn't working. Today, I had two shots that I wanted to do and I forgot to click record. Like, it's just, it's a comedy of errors. Like the people that do YouTube videos, it's much harder than Twitter threads, much harder. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's why our whole rule here at Acquisitions Anonymous is one take. Everybody knows the rules. <laughs> take everybody knows the rules. You take, <laughs> you get what we give you. You take what we give you. <laughs> All right. So we have an Axial deal today. So Heather, Heather, you're going to read this one? I will read it. This is from Axial, the largest secondary marketplace for buyers, sellers, and renters of vacation properties with a 40% EBITDA margin. Uh, it is an online marketplace uh, for buyers, sellers, and renters. I already said that. Resell and rental of unused timeshare weeks, DIY and full service options, 2.7 million users, 43% growth in paid membership since 2022. 500,000 site visits per month, robust mix of service offerings and price points, growth opportunities, increase uptake of online booking platform, uh, grow brand recognition through aggressive marketing strategy, sustainability, uh, recurring revenue through auto-renewing membership fees, fully remote workforce and online-only business model, competitive advantages, excellent brand reputation, lowest cost provider in the market. So revenue, we've got 21 and 22 here. Revenue has been 8.5 million in 21 and 12.4 in 2022. With the, that's a year over year growth rate of 46%. EBITDA in 21 was 3 million and it's 4.9 million in 22. EBITDA margin was 35% in 21 and is now 40% in 22. Sounds pretty interesting. What do you guys think? So this is a marketplace for people who are selling, it says vacation properties. Do we think this is like mostly timeshares or is this like Airbnbs? Is this, I don't want to use a realtor. What is going on here? I, my thesis with this is this is a platform where if you can't use your timeshare week, you go and you sell it on this platform to somebody else. That's what, that's what I'm reading it to this platform or this listing. Yep. That, that's what it sounds like to me too. Like, I don't get the sense this is like 
sell your Airbnb necessarily like entirely without a realtor sell on this platform. It's more sell fractional timeshare slots. It's just the slots, which is interesting. So it's not, it's not saying, you know, just get rid of your timeshare with us. Cause I think there are businesses that definitely focus on that. This is like, you know, you're only going to use one of your three weeks and you're going to sell the other two through here. Find you find people who are going to rent the, the property that way. Um, which is interesting because I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of people who just want to get out from under the timeshares. Um, <laughs> Isn't that like the central theme of timeshares, right? Like everybody wants to not be in the timeshare anymore. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a boat. It's like the best day is the best, day, the two days of timeshare ownership or the day you buy it and the day you sell it or get out from under it. But they don't say that about pizza boats, Bill. That's Just true. Saying. That's true. Pizza <laughs> boats are separate. I've never heard that so said. It's a good day. I Googled buy, you know, buy timeshare weeks. And uh, this site, redweek.com, may be what we're looking at here because they claimed in their header to be the world's largest secondary marketplace for <laughs> buying timeshare weeks. <laughs> so uh, it, I think it may be these guys, but it looks like you can go through here and you can buy timeshare nights wherever. At, Marriott's Aruba Surf Club, the Manhattan Club in New York, New York. Um, I didn't know they had timeshares in New York, in New York City, but I guess they have timeshares everywhere. And here's one in Hawaii as well. Yeah, this high likelihood because they say they've got an audience of three million on this website, and the listing says the audience is two point seven million users. So, <laughs> uh, high likelihood here uh, on this acquisitions anonymous episode. <laughs> hey, just so you know, your teaser, I know you try to anonymize it. We figure it out pretty quick most times. <laughs> so is this a good business? I mean, it's got 40% EBITDA margins. It's growing 40% a year. Uh, is I'm having like, it's a platform is asset light. It's basically software. It's a marketplace. This on all on the face of it seems like a great business. What am I missing? Uh, it's got a lot of network effects to it. You know, the same thing that works for eBay and Airbnb. Like if you're going to pick the one place to list your list, your property, you're going to go where everybody else is listing it. And if you're a buyer, you're going to go to the same place as well. I mean, the interesting thing about this is I don't know if it's gotten to a size like some of the other, you know, marketplaces I just talked about, eBay or Airbnb where they get so big that eventually they just own the whole market. You know, it looked like when I Googled this, there were a bunch of options of places you could go buy and sell a timeshare uh, in terms of timeshare weeks. So I love the business, but it has me like, there's some dynamic of like the, the marketplace aspect that I don't know if it's as great as your typical marketplace, if that makes sense. Just because you don't think it, it has this winner take all dynamic there's plenty of places to shop for and swap timeshare rentals yeah i don't know how sticky it is i mean there's there's this dynamic where in these marketplaces the bigger they get the more powerful they get but if you're in a pretty niche market and you're doing a relatively small thing uh you don't get the same kind of like power of scale right because like the mm -hmm. if you look at the network effect thing i'm about to go like super nerdville like there's like this like power function of how valuable the network and each time you add a node it like gets exponentially more valuable because of all the other connections anyway like but when you have a small network it's pretty you know it, it's it's not as easy to get those powers so i'm worried that they don't have that dominant of a position but i mean at first glance during 35 percent ebitda margin and it's the type of business that i love like it's pretty good <laughs> so so anyway I'm on, I'm on i'm on the fence what about covid in in 2020 you know is it yeah, good point, Heather. Yeah. What about COVID in 2020? What is going on here? Yeah. I mean, clearly it's got to be affected, right? Well, I guess I've looked at a few travel businesses uh, lately that I, I, a lot of people are cautious about them because we know there's a big, you know, rebound effect uh, post COVID with travel. And and the, the notion is that kind of where does that settle down? Maybe it doesn't matter as much though to this business because it's a two-sided marketplace and and maybe as you know, as people travel less, they're, the sellers are, are going to be on this platform more, uh, and maybe they'll drop their price more. I, maybe it doesn't matter. But anything travel related, I kind of wonder, um, you know, where is the trend for travel going overall, and what what kind of spending are consumers going to continue to do there? Yeah, I, I I'm curious because they don't show 2019, 2020, et cetera, so you can't really isolate that COVID impact. 
Uh, that's a question I want to really ask this business direct because you could see to your point, Heather, maybe it's better, like more activity, p- more people have timeshares, more people now want to get out from under them. And this business makes money coming and going, you know, as long as people are, tra- are transacting, right? As long as there's a volume of timeshares out there, this business does well. But at the same time, if you hit a recession, you know, you could end up with a lot of supply of timeshare weeks and not a lot of demand. And then your your market isn't clearing and you're not getting paid either. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know off the top of my head how to peg this from a COVID point of view. So the, uh, the bill to your question about how dominant is their position or not, you know, I Googled it and I pulled it up here. You're, I Googled rent timeshare weeks and Red Week comes up both number one, having paying the most for advertising. Uh, so they showed up first of the sponsored links. And then there's four sponsored links. And then Red Week, Red Week, which is the name of this company, showed up first in the organic results. And then as I scroll down, so there's there's four sponsored. Um, so they all look like they're trying to resell stuff. And then it looks like Red Week and Go Koala and then a handful of others are all competing in this marketplace. It feels it feels very much like a lot of the marketplaces that have emerged around remote work and stuff like that. There's like a half dozen that seem to be viable in, in all kinds of different sizes. So it's definitely not a winner-take-all market so far. Do you think, and then I got to start to think about kind of the long-term viability of this. And you got to think about it from two ways. If you're a marketplace, is the thing that you're marketplacing going to still be around like time sh- our timeshare is still going to be a thing probably um but then is someone going to come in and take this and i see also michael on your screen uh vacasa is bidding on this term mm-hmm. and you start to think about you know can expedia can kayak can vacasa can airbnb uh verbo like all there's, there's a lot of adjacent very big very well capitalized competitors here that could essentially just decide to take your market. Uh, and that would scare me a little bit. I really want to think through, let's say Airbnb wants to take your market, or let's say Vacasa or Expedia or one of these guys, they decide that timeshares is their thing. It finds its way onto a strategic roadmap inside of Expedia HQ, and they want to come get you. What do you do? Can you do anything except get road killed? Maybe not. That would make me pretty nervous. Like that's a strong network effect you got to have because these other places have network effects too that they can beat you over the head with. So that would scare me. It's interesting. So I was curious why VBRO or Airbnb doesn't really list here. And according um, according to their website for Red Week, what they're doing, they feel like they're, there's this graphic here that I pulled up where it's like a timeshare kind of acts like a hotel but it also acts like a vacation rental. So you get multiple bedrooms, living areas, kitchens, all that stuff per owner pricing from vacation rentals, but you get the aspects of a hotel that maybe you like, like concierge, restaurants, pools, and a front desk person that's there. So I guess maybe your mode, I mean, I'm just spitballing here, maybe your mode against Airbnb and VBRO is, or VRBO is they don't really want to be in that business of like, dealing with unhappy people, you know, who are unhappy with the concierge or whatever. That's my only guess, Bill. Yeah, just there's something about the product that's different enough that, you know, it's a, it's a different take. It's hard to shoehorn into the XPD interface alongside hotels and vacation rentals. That being said, I don't know. It would make me nervous. It would make me very nervous. If, if XPD wants your market, they're probably going to get it. Do you need video content for your business that doesn't suck? Double Jump Media is your one-stop shop for high-quality, highly engaging video content. They have over a decade of experience producing great, memorable videos for their clients across North America and beyond. And those clients have taken those videos and turned that into millions more in sales for their business to help them grow and achieve their goals. And a distinguishing characteristic that sets them apart is they have a small team that does everything in-house. So what you see on their portfolio page and what you see on their website, that's what you're going to get. They do everything soup to nuts, consulting, scripting, strategy, production, post-production, helping you put it all together to produce something that is just as top-notch as your brand. So whether you're rebranding an existing product, you've just bought a business, or you're trying to grow the one that you have, the Double Jump team is one that is down to clown. By the way, they wrote that down to clown thing. I know what it means, but it sounds awesome. 
So to get in touch with them, visit doublejump.media, fill out their form, tell them that we sent you, have an introductory call at no cost to you, and figure out what's best for your business. They're great folks and can help you on your journey in producing amazing video content to help meet your business needs and goals. And thanks to them for sponsoring today's episode. There's something that just doesn't smell right about this listing as well. Like this is, this is a pretty, you know, travel's a huge space. This type of online media property, like why hasn't this been picked up by Red Media or, you know, any one of kind of the, the aggregators of different brands around this stuff? So I don't know. There's just that feeling I have. I'm like, wait, why are we the lucky buyer to get to see this on Axial? Um, which Axial is awesome, but like, why did this go that far, right? There's tons of known buyers in this space. PE specializing in travel, for example, Red Media, all those folks. So anyway, that's just something in my mind I would want to understand why when I had a conversation with the seller here. And I go back to your question, Bill, like our timeshare is going to be around. I'll take the other side of that. Maybe not as much, you know, um, I, I, are people still buying new timeshares at the rate that they used to be? And are they, are they successfully getting out from under them? Is there, you know, is there a diminishing supply of these excess timeshare weeks? Uh, I would, I guess my gut says I tend to think so. I could be wrong. Yeah. I, so this is not something I'm super familiar with, but as we sit here in late 2023, right? There's a high high chance of recession, or at least higher chance than there was a couple of years ago. Who knows if it's going to yeah. happen? But I think that's a, a consideration for anybody making an investment right now is how does the thing I'm investing in fare in a recessionary, high interest rate environment? Um, and I am sure there are there is history and data on how the timeshare industry does in recessions. Like you look at 2008, you know, places or or times when property values are cratering right? How do timeshares in those properties do? Probably not great either. But again, this is a marketplace. It kind of doesn't matter at what price right. the market clears, just so long as it clears for these right. guys. Good point. Good point. You are seeing, I think to your point, Heather, a trend of people starting to spend more time back at hotels. I think so many people are having these bad experiences at Airbnbs and VBRO, VRBOs. Um, that they're like, wait, you want me to do the dishes and like change the sheets? Like, what, <laughs> why, why am I paying you all this money for a cleaning fee? So I think I do think there's a swing back. And I just pulled out the data actually uh, to your question about the timeshare sales. And 2022 was exactly the same as 2019. It bounced uh, basically the timeshare industry of sales volume cut in half during 2020 and then has fully recovered back through 2022. So it turns out, Bill, I don't know if you're aware of this. Turns out that COVID did not affect people's uh, inability to uh, to avoid uh, high pressure sales tactics. <laughs> They're back <laughs> to buying timeshares again. I thought we all got smarter. Yeah, we didn't. I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's it's so tempting though. Like I don't know if you guys have ever been subject to one of these high pressure sales tactics. Like. The debate is so lucrative. It's like a free week at Disney and all you have to do is sit in this one hour presentation. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, I can resist anything for one hour. And then half of them walk out with timeshares at Disney. It's incredible. Yeah, I guess it's true. I just, I I, I never sat in for one. That's the thing. I, I, I always knew that was the, the problem and I didn't want, I just don't like sitting there with a high pressure salesperson at all. I would, I would, just detest that, but it works and that's why they do it. You know, one of the greatest things my parents said when I was a kid, they took us to a timeshare pitch probably back in the early nineties. And I remember being a teenager. I was like, we're going to buy a timeshare dad. And he's like, no, no, you just need to see how this works. And like that way, when you run into it as an adult, you don't fall into yeah. this trap. We went there, they served us breakfast and they worked my dad hard. I remember them just like sitting there and like, he was like, we're ready to go now. Thank you for the breakfast. Thank you for the free night. Like, we're ready to go. No, no, sir. Like, one more thing. I want to talk to you. Are you sure? Don't you love your family? I <laughs> think we're sitting there. I'm like, yeah. Like, what does that have to do with the timeshare? So it was really a good thing my parents did. But man, I, if you're interested in something fun, there's like videos on YouTube about timeshare sales strategies. And like, they have it down to a science. Like, you walk through the casinos in Vegas and they know exactly like who they should target, what the profiles are. Like Bill, you and I walk past there together. They're not gonna like, 
even take a moment to talk to us. They don't even look us in the face. They just let us walk right by. But the right profile walks by, like they know, they know exactly who to grab. Uh, they have a whole spotting operation. I mean, it's they're they're sophisticated. Hunting operation is what it sounds like to me. <laughs> no, it sounds creepy. Uh, it's also an interesting thing when you uh, when you like I've had it have a couple times where employees would leave and come back. They're like, "I'm an investor now." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, what happened?" And they're like, "I went to vacation and I bought a timeshare." And I'm like, "Where?" They're like, "Costa Rica." And I'm like, "Geez, this is awful." Like, <laughs> and, so it's like awful in all regards because in one regards I'm like, man, like I'm so sorry that this you did this. But then secondarily, like uh, questioning, like, oh man, <laughs> like uh, I, I hired this person for good judgment, and they go to Costa Rica and do this. It's like, oh man, <laughs> a, little, a little worrisome. Yeah, yeah. not great. Uh, so, I mean, do you guys think this is going to trade? I mean, this is it's five million bucks of EBITDA. It's a marketplace. It's growing forty six percent year over year. This is going to trade, right? Someone's going to buy this. Someone's going to buy it. Yes, hundred percent for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I mean, it's got to trade at eight to 12 times, like 2022, easily, maybe more. So you think this is a 40 to $60 million deal? It seems Probably like it's going to trade that. Somebody's got to model it. In my opinion, somebody will model it as um, a growth story. And when things grow 40% year over year for a decade, anything underwrites. And I think private equity will do that and uh, put money into growth build up the thing and try to create a winner take all proposition. So yeah, I would say it will trade 50 million plus. You can grow this for two years at 40% and it makes all kind of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm still low. If you, you can keep higher. growing at 48%. See, I'm the skeptic. I don't think you can. I think that that's a post COVID tailwind and that you, you don't continue to grow at that pace, but I agree, Heather, and here's why I kind of sniff the, this has got to slow down. Something's going on because it's only 12 million in sales, right? If you run back the 40% growth, you know, from 12 million back towards zero, like this thing just either can't be that old, or if it is old, it wasn't growing that fast the whole time, right? Which means the fast growth is probably a more recent phenomenon. And as we know, in the recent rear view, is COVID. And even at this point, you know, from the outside looking in here, we don't understand exactly how COVID impacted this business, but it's travel. And I would bet money it did impact this business somehow. Yeah. Right. And you got to yeah. unpack that. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So any travel business that I've looked at lately has this kind of growth. Maybe, you know, the percentages are slightly different, but it's a lot of growth since 2020. Uh, and and that's exactly what we do. We go back to 18, 19. We see where we were then. We almost kind of discount 20 and 21 in our minds. And, and we try to think about what where does this normalize? And it, it doesn't keep growing like that. And you figure recession. But on the other hand, we've got that, well, that brings more sellers maybe to the, to the marketplace here. Uh, and maybe the sellers are even willing to drop their price. So stuff still does clear to your point. Hard, it's got it's a hard one to project, uh, but I do think it's definitely going to sell, and probably for a big multiple. Michael, let me ask you this: Are marketplaces good businesses? Are subscale marketplaces are the type of marketplaces that our listeners are probably looking at buying? Good businesses. I'm not talking about the Airbnbs of the world, the scaled things that have massive network effects. Are subscale marketplaces good businesses or no? Uh, I believe strongly they are. Especially if you okay. can be a winner in a niche. I don't know. What do you think? You asked that like, I'm like, well, should I reconsider it? <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm wondering, it's the type of thing, subscale marketplaces don't always exhibit the same winner take all dynamics as, as scaled marketplaces, right? Uh, it seems to me, and I'm a dummy here, so tell me if I'm off. It seems to me that it is more about what percentage of your market have you captured. Like if it's a niche market and you have 90% of it, that is a scaled marketplace, even right. at 5 million in EBITDA, right? I mean, that's, you own it. There's no other network to be had. You have the, you have the whole network. Everybody has to go to you to transact in that thing, unless your little niche of the world gets gobbled by one of the big marketplaces who have infinity money. That's the part that scares me. I agree with you, Bill. I agree with you. And I think let's look at our small business marketplaces as an example, as a 
you know, there's a lot of them and uh, it, nobody really has the scale. I don't think even though biz by has got a lot of stuff on there. Uh, I, I, I don't think, um, I think they're all kind of fighting for their little patch of, of uh, the market and um, they're vulnerable. You know, I, I think that they're okay businesses at this point, if they're not scaled. Yeah. I mean, I, I think also uh, impacting them is the customer use like approach. So for example, like what you're talking about with the B2B trying to sell and list and become like, you know, whatever the eBay for selling businesses. Well, the problem is it's like really difficult to generate liquidity there because the the items are so difficult to price and they're so heterogeneous in the case of small businesses. And then people don't transact that often which is one of the problems with a lot of these, like I want to be Uber for X businesses, like people are just not buying the thing that often. So it's hard to have liquidity in your market and, and create kind of that network effect that really matters. So there's been a lot of study. I mean, to you guys' point about what makes marketplaces work and when they work and when they don't, how they end up fragmented, which it looks like what this market play market is currently. Um, but in their defense, it looks like there's a winner and a number two in this market, which is pretty standard for distribution, right? You have Airbnb and VBRO. Maybe these guys are the number one. They claim to be number one. And number two is the Koala one that, that I pulled up a few minutes ago. So anyway, I think fundamentally, they're great businesses. You can tell from the EBITDA margin. Uh, I think there is a definitely, to Heather's question, like, should you consider this a COVID bump business? Because... I think to your point, Heather, you do the math and you see what happened with timeshare sales during post COVID. Yeah, they're back to 2019 and that's how you got 50% year over year growth, but they did a 50% decrease uh, for, for a year in 2021 to be able to have that privilege to grow, no. grow 50% so it's flat, year for two actually. years. It's flat. Yeah. 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 In theory, I would be curious what the 2019 is here. I bet you go back to the 2019 and it's about 12 million. Yeah. These that's my guess too. So you think they're just basically right back to where they were? Uh, that's my very first question is what does 2019 look? I, uh, as a betting man, I would bet it's exactly the same. So if that's the case, it's tough to imagine this trading for 10 times or 12 times. I think you're probably trading closer to eight or seven. EBITDA, times EBITDA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't have anything further on this one. Someone's going to buy it. Not going to be me though. Let's role play a little bit. Let's say you were curious about this business, Bill. What would be the first steps you would take? So I would do two things in parallel. One, I would obviously reach out to, this, to the broker, right? And try to get some more info. But the other thing I would do is begin immediately working my network to see if I could find anybody that owned a timeshare, invested in timeshares, had their pulse on this industry. I'd want to talk to brokers of timeshares. I want to talk to anybody that could kind of get me into the timeshare industry so I can get a non-biased take on what's going on. Because uh, the brokers, everything the broker gives you is totally biased. So you want to get you want to get somebody that has their pulse on the timeshare industry and figure out what's going on. That would be the first thing I would do. Yeah. And I would add a third one to that. I would do exactly those things. You know, there is a whole world of study and how people think and talk about and have analyzed these types of marketplaces and what makes a good one and how you determine the different dynamics. Like those people are on Twitter, they write stuff on their blogs because they're VCs that invest in that kind of stuff. So I would actually spend, in addition, I would go spend a couple of weekends and just go read everything they've written, find those Twitter accounts, and then learn as much and go deep into understanding how online marketplaces work really well. I mean, if it seemed like I answered your question like a dilettante, Bill, like I didn't really know other than, yeah, marketplaces are a good business and they're complicated, like that would be my next step is to appreciate that and go dig in and try to understand the space. So I really get in and know the dynamics before I go spend 70 or $60 million on this business. I would spend a couple of weekends before I do. Probably a good plan. Hey, you know, I'm a hardworking guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, wait, I'm hosting today, right? Because I don't yeah, want to start talking. To out, yeah. <laughs> All right, we got anything else to say? Heather, you got anything else on your mind? I don't. All right. I think this was a good one. Thanks again to Axial for having some good stuff. Man, it's much better than looking at bars and grills and HVAC. Yeah. <laughs> that is the truth. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. If you enjoyed this, do us a favor. Uh, take the video of this. Uh, print it out and go take it to the nearest uh, truck stop that you know of and put it on the wall. 
uh, with a please listen to this podcast and have our website on there. No, we're just joking. Please tell a friend about it. Somebody who wants to learn about business, they're curious about it. This is a great podcast um, to see business from the angles they don't talk about in textbooks. And uh, if you could share it with a friend, the content is free, but that is our ask. Uh, tell a friend about it and we would appreciate it greatly. So thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.